Hi there, Neil from Diagonal Move here. Welcome back to the channel. And this video is the latest in a series of videos which looks at games that make me go, huh. It's a series of games which are not linked together in any way, apart from the fact that they intrigue me or confuse me or stand out to me in some way more than some of the other games that I feature on the channel. The game that I'm going to look at today is a game I nearly sold after playing it for the first time. I'll get into the reasons why in a moment, but the game that we are looking at is Dawn of Empire, the Spanish-American Naval War, 1898. It's a mouthful of a title and a migraine of a game to learn. I'll come back to that in a moment as well. The purpose of the game though is you're playing either as the Spanish naval fleet or the American naval fleet at the turn of the 20th century, and you're uh, controlling squadrons of ships as they move around the Caribbean Sea, off the coast of South America and on into the Atlantic and up the eastern coast of the USA. You'll place orders onto each of these squadrons of ships that will determine where they're going to go, how they're going to react. Maybe they'll blockade somewhere or, or raid a port, or they'll be on patrol, or maybe they'll have to refuel. And how you play those orders uh, will be very important in determining how you're going to act the turn later and then possibly even the turn after that. So there's a lot of forward thinking in this game. There's also uh, a lot of hidden movement, a lot of fog of war, which makes it very interesting um, when you're trying to play the game to work out what the other person's doing. Um, really interesting mechanics in there. Um, the game is two players, and, and I have been playing it solo, um, but I'll say up front, it's probably, in fact, almost certainly a better game for two than solo because of all that hidden movement that you have. The um, other thing with this game is the Spanish fleet, if you play the, the base scenario, and there's a few optional rules that you can modify the base scenario with, but if you play the basic game, the Spanish fleet are so massively outnumbered. It's a really interesting puzzle to figure out how the Spanish can possibly win against this overwhelming number of, of American ships with reinforcements that come in uh, over the course of, you know, of a few turns. I mean, there's only six turns in the whole game if you play the basic game, and yet the Americans will get reinforcements on three of those turns. The Spanish don't get any, and so you're on the back foot the whole way through the game as the Spanish player, and you almost have to do this like hit and run raids down the coastline of, of the US and, and the Caribbean, while at the same time trying to protect your ports from these blockades and these bombardments of, of, of the ports, because the ports are a massive way to get victory points. All in, it's an incredibly interesting game that really lets you puzzle it out, even playing solo, and I mean, you don't have the hidden fog of war elements playing solo obviously but you do have such such a puzzle with how you're going to get these orders to achieve the aim of one side or the other and the two sides do play quite differently they're not asymmetric in any particular way other than the numbers of forces and the ships which are obviously based in the historical um, orders of battle as it were but they, they, how they achieve their objectives just seems so different within this this construct of of the the orders and where the ports are located on the board and how you control areas around the board all in all really really interesting game that i am so glad i did not sell after the first play now why did i nearly sell the game after the first play and the answer is this rule book it is awful in my opinion um it is wall of text all the way through i mean i don't know if you can see that very clearly but it's wall-to-wall -wall text. There's a few red elements which give you a few hints of where to go, but there are so many dense paragraphs, little tiny things in, in the rules, um, which you know are hidden in a, a wall, this wall of text. It's just horrible to try and make any head or tail of, I found from speaking for myself. There is also this, the player aid, which is more dense wall of text on both sides. It's really not helpful <laughs> from my, my opinion. It really is not helpful to learn the game at all when you just have paragraph to paragraph of text. There's a great big long um, example of play, which is great, but it is still this wall of text that you have to read. And I don't learn very well that way. And maybe there's a, a reason it's done like this. Uh, the game is 
inspired or based on uh, a series of games called The War at Sea from many years ago. And maybe this format is in keeping with that style, I don't know. But never having played those games and coming into gaming in the last seven or eight years, there is no reason why a player aid or a rule book should be so dense and unnecessarily dense because the game is not actually that difficult once you get the hang of what the rule book is trying to tell you. And I just think to myself as I play, there's got to be a better way of doing this. Now, how do I know there's got to be a better way of doing this? Well, the answer is somebody, some kind soul over on Board Game Geek has actually done a better version. And it's simple stuff like breaking those paragraphs into bullet points, simple things like that. And yet the game is such a, a dense game with so many little things here and there that I've had to underline masses of text to make sure I don't miss any of those individual little points. One thing that frustrated me, particularly about the player rate, is that there were no tables on it showing you where things start, what the victory points are and so on. And that same person on Board Game Geek has done that for us. And I can honestly say, without this rule book and without that player rate, this video wouldn't be happening because the game would be over on a well-known internet shopping site at the very least. But I persevered. I found that rule book, waded through the rule book, had some helpful hints from that that uh, fan-made rule book and I found that Dawn of Empire is actually a fantastic game filled with interesting decisions, cool mechanics and history which I knew nothing about beforehand. All the things that make this game worthwhile featuring in this series of videos where I look at things in a little bit more detail. Now because this game is quite involved. There's a lot of different things going on in the Hidden Movement. What I will probably do is I'll probably do the overall view of the rules and so on in this video like I normally do, but then the example of play I will probably move to another video at the risk of having a very very long video for you all to sit through. Anyway, hopefully that's a good overview before I jump in the rules. If you do like this video please click like, subscribe, all the usual stuff that helps support the channel. Let's begin our look at the rules for Dawn of Empire with a look at the map and the various elements of the map. As with many of my videos, this is intended to give you an overall sense of how things play and what's involved in the game rather than the minutiae of all the detail because there, as with many war games, there is a lot of detail. So this is just to give you a sense of how it works. Well, the map is really split into three groups of areas. Green is the land and we have the the eastern seaboard of the US, Mexico, Central America, and then the tip of Southern of South America just here. We then have the light blue areas, which is the largest portion of the map, um, which represents the Caribbean Sea, the um, coast of North of South America, Gulf of Mexico, and, and so on. Then these darker blue areas represent the Atlantic Ocean and that's separated into north, central, and south. On the map we have um, these circles. A yellow circle is a Spanish controlled port. A blue circle, like this one here in Key West, is an American controlled port. And then there are some which are sort of a washed out greyish white. They are neutral ports. We also have on the board um, some iconography relating to uh, VPs and movement costs for each of these areas and these are represented by the squares and the text underneath the squares. Each of the areas has a different movement cost and a different VP value for control of that area depending on which side you're on. For example, Columbia Basin here in text underneath it says 1 MP that means it costs one movement point to enter that location. The blue box has one meaning there's one uh, VP for the Americans if they control it, but it's a zero VP area for the Spanish. Here at the Windward Passage it's reversed. We have two movement points to enter. One VP if the Americans control it, two VPs if the Spanish control it. We'll get more into how you control things in a moment. Um, on the board as well, we do have this table here, which is used when ships are 
in the same area or end their movement in the same area together determines whether or not they have combat. Get into that when we do the combat phase. The VP track is here and it's a sliding scale with positive American VPs here. Should the Americans lose all their VPs, we start moving to the Spanish side of the map, the board even. Um, the tokens are reversible to reflect which side has the positive VP counter. And then there's a turn track here, six turns in the basic game. And then there's some other turns, should you wish to play with optional rules, which again, we'll, we'll go into later. There are also some reinforcements on that track as well for the Americans. Worth noting in this, as we look at this setup, most of these tokens are upside down because everything in the game is hidden in the basic two player game. All of these stacks are ships and we'll look at the tokens in a moment and they are all placed face down so that the opponent cannot see them. The only other thing on the map to point out are these ports. These do start face up. Look at those counters in a moment. But each controlled port, whether that's American or Spanish, does have port defences. And we'll look at those in a moment as well. Bit more detail on the counters. And let's just take a stack, for example. Let's use Havana. We have um, the port itself and then this pile of counters. There is a leader and then a number of ships. And starting with the uh, most numerous tokens, we have the, the ships. A lot of text on the ships plus a range of numbers. Starting in the top corner and going clockwise, we have the type of ship. There is a table on those um, fan-made rules that details what the type of ship they are. I'm not going to go into each one now, but there's a number of different types, and the different types reflect different VPs when um, they are destroyed in combat. Then we have the starting location. HV is Havana. You may have uh, a CE for San Juegos, and then uh, an, an SA for Santiago, uh, KW for Key West, that kind of thing. And that's the starting location. Some of the counters will also have a number in a small white circle. That is the reinforcements uh, turn of entry note. Um, there are also some with asterisks which are optional for use should you choose to play any of the optional rules. But as I said, we'll get into that a bit later. The white text is the name of the ship. So we have here the Alfonso the Twelfth, the Ensenada, the uh, I Isabel, and the Venedita. That's there for flavour. Then we have the four is the movement allowance, and that is the um, uh, you pay movement from the movement allowance to move between areas. The central one is the defence. And the one on the left hand side is the attack strength. When you stack the, sh the, sh the ships together, and the reason, one of the reasons you put them upside down is because the order in which they are stacked is the order in which they go into combat. And the leader is always stacked with the topmost ship when it comes into combat. Now, for these four ships, doesn't really matter a huge amount. But if I was to take perhaps um, these ships here from Cadiz, you have the leader, then you have a top counter has a, a movement of four, strength of two, defense of two. But then the ships start to become a little bit different. And uh, you'll see that the movement points and the strength points uh, will be quite varied and so when you stack them you must plan how you're going to stack them in the stack because that is how they will stay throughout combat until the end of the turn and you begin the next turn you can reorganize things okay so that's the ships let's not worry about any more about the ships let's look instead at the leaders and we'll choose this guy here uh man mantarola uh help you can see it when it we have a star. You might just be able to see that. Maybe better to use um, Kamara there from Cadiz. So we have a star or a number of stars. That is the rating of the leader. How good is he a leader? Has implications for combat. 
and also victory points should they get killed. Um, then we have the starting location, Ciso de Scudis, HV is Havana. Uh, the name, mostly for flavour, and the um, uh, the, the uh, squadron is the black text. So this is the Havana squadron, this is the first Scudis squadron. Mm, there for flavour, really, more than anything. Okay, so we've done leaders and we've done ships. Pretty straightforward as far as war game stuff goes. Um, nothing massively untoward. Now let's look at ports. Ports are slightly different. And I'll start not in the top corner, but I'll start here. Um, so here we have the location as before. It's the Havana, HV Havana. It, it starts there. The black text just says the name. Uh, flavor again. The zero is the movement allowance number. It's a zero allowance because port defenses do not move, so you cannot move these counters. The defense there is eight, quite high, and then the attack is seven. This number here is what's known as the mine defense. And depending on what order you have given when you attack ports, and we'll get into this more with combat, but depending on what order you've given, you will either use the regular strength or the mine strength when it comes to the combat, depending on what order the opposing side has. Other counters we see in the game are various markers. So we have damage markers. We have these order tokens. I don't have the, the name of the order one. We have coal there and patrol for the Spanish. There are also the double-sided control areas to show which um, area is under the control of which side, I'll get more into that in a moment as well. And then finally, there is a marker or two to reflect whether a unit has been sunk or disabled in combat. So in terms of the counters, there's quite a lot of them, but they're not too complex as far as war game counters go. Before we dive into the sequence of play and in more detail look at how the game fits together, quick note about squadrons and independent units. Independent units are single ships. Squadrons are groups of ships, at least two. Squadrons may or may not have a leader Independent units may or may not have a leader. Independent units really can't do very much except move. They're assumed to have what's referred to as transit orders. They can't, compete, can't really be given any other orders and they can't control areas. They can't um, uh, be involved in combat. Squadrons, on the other hand, can control areas, they can be involved in combat, and uh, are really very important um, in terms of how you, you, you win the game, your makeup of your squadrons. Why do you have independent units? Well, predominantly because you may have a damage or, um, or something in combat which requires you to go back to port and you may have a ship on its own. You, some of the game, some of the the units start as independent units and they come on the board as reinforcements as independent units as well, some of them. So you have this distinction between how independent units and squadrons operate in the game. And I'll be referring to that on and off throughout as we, as we go forward. The heart of a game of Dawn of Empire revolves around orders. What orders you place, when you place them and what happens the turn after in terms of orders that must follow other orders in a set sequence. It's not programming, but you need to think a little bit further ahead to make sure you don't find yourself out of position and so on when you are placing certain orders. And alternatively, can you determine how to best attack your opponent based on the orders that they've given? The orders are the same orders. Um, on both sides. But you have a slightly different makeup of orders for the Spanish versus the Americans, and as you can see, the Americans do have slightly more orders, but I think that's 
partly due to the uh, extra ships that the Americans have. So what are those orders? They are anchor, blockade, coal, patrol, raid, sortie, transit, and then second transit. What I'm going to do now is go through each one of those orders in turn and explain roughly what it is and how it works. Let's start with anchor. Different uses for anchor depending on where you are at sea, but the principle is the same. It's basically a pause to refuel, to uh, regroup and so on. If you are, as the squadron here are, in port, you don't move them out of port and you decide to you're just going to leave them there for the whole turn. They are assumed to have an anchor order. And what that means is they stay where they are, basically. If the squadron is at sea and you're in an area with a friendly or a neutral port and you give them an anchor order, they must move to the port and that's where they end their turn. If they are at sea, and there is no port, for example, here in the Nares Abyssal, they simply stay where they are and they don't move. Should an anchored uh, fleet find itself in the same space as an enemy fleet, then they can defend, but they cannot, they cannot begin and attack themselves, but they can defend. If you have placed an anchor order on a squadron in the previous turn, you can then give any of the other orders to that squadron uh, without any restriction. Blockade. Blockade is the act of moving your ships into the vicinity of, a, of an opposing port and attacking that port. When you place a blockade order on the ship, on the squadron, you must move to an area with an opposing port and then stop your turn. You then, during the combat phase, and we'll get to the different phases shortly, you will then begin an attack first on the enemy squadron and then if you are still there, you will then attack the port. If you are still surviving and you've defeated the squadron and the port, you then score victory points for the attack on the port, plus any units you may have destroyed during the attack. Importantly, when you blockade, you must coal afterwards. mandatory to coal a turn after you've done a blockade. This is the act of refueling and resupplying that squadron that did the attack. Coal. If you coal or are obliged to coal, your unit will not move for this turn. You do not have to move to a port like you would do anchor, but you cannot move. If an enemy was to move into the space, you can defend, but you would not be an attacker yourself. If you are not in port when you coal, there is a restriction on the number of units that can be coaled. For the Spanish, it's eight, and for the Americans, it's 11. you can have an unlimited number of units coaling in a port. After you have coaled, the next turn you can give any order that you choose for the squadron that coaled. Patrol. When you place a patrol order on a ship, you may be at port, you may be at sea when you place that, that order. What you do is you move a maximum of two spaces. 
two areas. Now that could be from the port to a space and then two areas, or if you're already at sea, two areas, and then you must stop. When you have a patrol order, if an opposing squadron enters the area, they must stop their movement. Now, normally everything would be uh, hidden. And so you must reveal that you have a patrol order if you wish to stop the opponent from moving. This is also true of the blockade order, order we looked at earlier. After you have patrolled, you must either anchor or cold. Raid. When you place a raid order, you must be within range of an enemy port and you must move into the area with the enemy port that you wish to raid. Then attack the port and potentially any squadrons, not independent units, but potentially any squadrons. And then if you survive the any attack with the squadrons, you will then fight the um, port. The difference between blockade and raid is that you will use the mine value in the top left hand corner for the combat, not the strength at the bottom left hand corner. After you've performed the raid, should you survive the following, you will score victory points for the for defeating the port and any ships that you have attacked are destroyed, but then you must give a transit order the following turn and that transit order must end with moving into a neutral or friendly port. Sortie. Sortie orders can only be given to squadrons that are in port where the adjacent area or areas in some cases have an enemy squadron. The order will result in the squadron moving into the sea area that's adjacent to the port and then stopping its movement and would then likely result in combat with this uh, with the squadron that is in the area if there is an applicable die roll on the dice uh, in the combat phase. Following the sortie order, you must be given a patrol, a raid or a transit order. Transit. When you give a squadron a transit order, you move the movement allowance of the squadron that you have placed the order with. If you move into a, an area where the opposing squadron has placed either a blockade or a patrol order on a squadron, you must stop. Otherwise, you can carry on to your full movement allowance. When you have finished your, your um, transit, the next turn you can do one of three things. You either pause using the anchor or coal orders, or you can transit for a second time using the second transit order, which is the same as the transit order, except you can no longer, you cannot do a transit order for a three consecutive times. Transit is a unique order in the sense that if you are in an area such as this one, you cannot control the area you are in, nor can you prevent another area, another squadron from controlling that area. So in this circumstance, even though there are two squadrons, the Americans would control the area because transit does not prevent them from doing so and cannot control the area in and of itself. You're moving through, basically. 
independent squadrons are always assumed to have transit orders and they can move their full movement allowance without needing to worry about or an enemy sides with uh, with orders like raid or blockade that would stop their movement. If you have the squadron moving into an area, you can join like so. More on that when we get into the movement section in just a moment. So how do you play the game? There are six, six turns and each player will do a number of um, actions within five phases of a turn. Once both players have completed their actions within each phase, you would move on to the next turn. The first phase is known as the new forces and orders phase. You will take reinforcements from the track, if there are any, and place them in their starting locations. Then you will assign orders to your squadrons. And that's simply a case of choosing an order and placing it on the relevant squadrons, bearing in mind those restrictions placed on the, the orders you can give this turn based on what orders you gave last turn. But let's just assume it's the first turn of the game and we're, we have a number of squadrons here and, every, and we have an order that has allowed, uh, perhaps an anchor order, that's allowed anything to be done with these counters here in Puerto Rico. We have two separate squadrons at the moment. Each one has a leader. Now we can, in the orders phase, and we would do this, this secretly, you can change the order of your squadron. So for example, if you wanted the leader here to be with the strongest ship and then have a descending uh, order of complexity, uh, of strength, you can change the order around like so, stack them back up and then obviously flip them over if you're playing with the hidden movement rules, which are the base rules. Or you could uh, split your forces into different different squads. You'll see that we have um, a, a squadrons here, oh, a, a single squadron under under Kamara with different movement allowances. Some have four, some have six. What you can do is split the squadrons up into separate squadrons in order to suit your needs for that turn. Two is the smallest size squadron. There are no maximum sizes. But remember, how you stack your forces in this phase is how they stay until the next turn when combat and everything has finished. So for example, if your strongest unit is in the middle, that is where it will stay until the next turn. So you may wish to think about how you want to stack your forces. Once you have decided how your forces are going to stack, you, you can place the orders on them based on what you would like them to do. And when both players have done that, you can then take the next turn of the game, which is known as the movement phase. Now the movement phase is going to be based on what you have done in the order. So for example, a blockade, you would have to move to an enemy that you can blockade. I put an enemy port that you can blockade that can't see one on the map at the moment for the Spanish, but you'd need to move this one to an area where you can blockade. Transit, you would move based on the normal movement allowance. But how do you move? Well, each of these ships has that movement allowance, as I mentioned, and you would move at the speed of the slowest unit in the stack. So here, the maximum we could move is five because of this one. And that is the allowance of movement that you can have. Now we start in Puerto Rico, we pay the movement cost to move to the area, which in this case would be two. And then you pay the movement cost for these uh, subsequent areas. That's one, so that's one, so that's four movement total. We can then move either the fifth movement point to the North Utican Basin, or we can stop because we cannot go here 
because the movement cost is going to take us over that limit. And so our transiting squadron could end up here or it could end up here based on the movement that you wish to do. As I mentioned, if you enter an area with an enemy squadron and that squadron has either a blockade or a patrol counter, you must stop. And the opposing side must reveal that they have that order. Independent units move in exactly the same way, but they don't have to stop for blockade or patrol orders. Basically, they can sneak through the, the net, so to speak. The Spanish will move first, and that's true every turn. Leaders, these guys here, must move with at least one ship. So they can move with an independent unit or they can move with a squadron. They cannot move on their own. If you are moving into a port, you pay the movement cost of the area the port is in. Here it is two, plus an additional one to enter the port. As you move, you can drop off units along the way and they would be considered to have the same orders that you would have given the main squadron. Equally, independent units can move to join a squadron. If you have two squadrons in an area at the end of one squad of squadron's movement, they will combine. If there is a larger stack and a smaller stack, the smaller stack will become part of the larger stack, keeping the order. If, however, they are the same size, they will join, but the player's choice as to which order they keep. If you end your movement in an area where there is an opponent, you will have to begin the combat phase, which we'll go on to now. The combat phase is, occurs when two opposing squadrons end their movement in the same area. You will consult this table called the search matrix chart. Now, this is a printout that I've done. The actual chart itself is printed on the board off the screen at the moment, but I've printed this out just for demonstration while we're, while we're here. Um, the first thing you do in the combat phase is work out who has the initiative. And you do that based on the number of units in a squadron uh, plus the number of stars on any leader. So here we'd have one, two, three, four, five units plus three. That is an eight. And then you would roll a die to um, get the final score. So in this case, we have rolled eight plus six, that is um, 14. The American side for their part have six, seven, eight, nine plus six, <laughs> that's 15. So the Americans would take the initiative. A quick note about the dice that come in the game, they don't roll very well and there are nowhere near enough. Um, they're very, very square, so they literally just drop. Um, and you need nine, ten dice sometimes in the combat phases. So what I would suggest you do is get some other dice that actually roll a bit better and are more numerous. But I digress. We have the initiative being the Americans and the um, non-initiative player being the Spanish. So you could cross-reference the order. So here we have a blockade and a patrol meaning that we have a patrol order, blockade order, a 1-5. That is the role you need in order to begin combat. I'll look into more detail on this table in a moment, but basically with the this table you will either fight, nothing will happen, 
or you will have what's called a VP event, and we'll get more into that later. But for now, just look at the fighting. So we have a roll of one to five, so let's roll one of my dice. I've got a three. We're going to go and fight. And this is where you transfer all of the units in the stacks onto this battle mat here in the order in which they were placed in their stacks. So I've gone and placed the ships in their initiative and non-initiative sides. Leaders are assumed to be on the first ship. In this example, there's an uneven number, and so the uneven number, the excess ships move to the second row, and you may find there are some on the third row and so on, depending on how many ships there are, and you, they're, they're overbalanced. And in some cases, it will be significantly outnumbered, and you will need to have quite a number of, of overlapping uh, units. What we do now is we roll dice. And the way it works is both sides will take a complete turn of combat um, before any results are applied. So, for example, we will take the strength value of the ship, roll that many dice, modifying it by the leader value, if, if any, and any excess ships. So, for example, here, this first combat will be seven base dice plus one die for the leader, plus two dice for the ship. Now, the leader has two stars, but in combat, the extra star goes to the next ship. So we'd roll all those dice, demonstration purposes, and we have a six, well, multiple sixes and some fives, and a bunch of other numbers. Okay. Now, in this game, fives count as disabled. Sixes are hits. You re-roll the hits, and the number that you get is the number of damage points the ship has taken, which in this case is, um, what is that, 15? Um, meaning that that ship is actually sunk because we have a greater value in damage than its damage value. So we have a five. Anything greater than five would sink that ship. But we do not apply the damage yet. We move on to this ship, which would be four dice plus one. So five dice. And here we have one hit and one disabled. Oh, and six damage points, meaning that is also sunk. Combat's pretty brutal in this game. With the um, damage overriding disabled if there is any, um, if, if the ship sinks. So then we do that all along the rows. Then the Spanish get to do it with their unmodified values. So for example, we'd have three plus one, which is four. We have one hit, five damage. That is equal to this ship. So we place the five damage with that ship. Now, it's not sunk because it's not greater than five. However, with the damage, you reduce the movement and the strength by the number of damage. So with a minimum value remaining of at least one attack and two movement. Now this is important because later on you may escape from combat or disengage as it's called uh, based on your speed levels. Now here the speed level would be reduced down to just two. Um, we'll get into that in a moment but we have damaged that ship. We do also have that leader on the ship. We need to roll the die again. On a roll of six that leader would have been killed. If the leader is on a ship that sinks, they are determined to be dead. They go down with their ship. And then the Spanish would... Um, we've done the attack here from the Spanish, and then we'd go all the way along until everyone has taken their attack. 
and then you apply the results. Moving the sunk and disabled ships off to one side and then reconfiguring the order of battle um, to the, so that the, the um, damaged ship is at the end like so and overlapping where needed. And then you start again. Now, if one side has um, lost all their units or they're disabled, combat's over. However, if you have some remaining, you then check for what's called um, disengagement by speed. And basically, if your ships are all faster than the opposing ships, you can break off combat early and go to a friendly port. However, if you do not have faster ships, you cannot break off combat. If you have an uneven number of ships, so for example, let's just pretend for a moment that we were fighting a number of ships that were uh, different values, let's say these, and the Americans decided they want to break off combat, the ships that were scored at six can disappear but these guys would have to fight now what happens when you're disabled well when you're disabled pretend this one's disabled you would take the ship out of the combat and then they would go to the nearest friendly port to where the to the area that the combat was taking place in and at some point the combat will be over and you move on to the, any combat in the next area, beginning again with that search uh, and initiative uh, um, element. What happens though if you have a port? Following on from any squadron combat, you then may have port combat. If there is any squadrons with a blockade or raid Order with a um, with a port, an opposing port in the same area, um, and what would happen is you would fight any squadrons in the area or in the port. If you survive, you then do the same combat against the um, the port, and it works basically the same way in which you place the units in the order that they are stacked facing against the port. Now the differences are, if I just pinch a couple more units to show, the differences are how the combat works. There's no overlapping in, in, in this case. But the first thing that would happen is this unit would attack with seven dice plus anything from the leader. Then the port would attack back and for blockade it would use its strength number. So in this instance, we would have seven dice against the port, and that would be hitting on fives and sixes, rolling again for any damage. Here we've done six damage. Simultaneously, the port would attack back, and for blockade, we use the strength here in the bottom left. Hit it with disabling that ship. Combat at this point would stop because we have destroyed or disrupted the port. Combat would stop. If, however, the port survives, you move on to the next one. Now, for blockade, it's every other squadron that it fights. So here, what would happen is we'd roll one dice, nothing would happen. Then both the Americans and then the Spanish would fight, the Americans only, Americans and Spanish. But remembering, as soon as the port is destroyed or disrupted, combat stops. And if the port is not destroyed at the end of the combat, we don't check for any disengagement. 
the combat just stops. There's only ever one round of combat with port combat, as many as is needed for the the other squadron based combat. Once you've done all the combats, one area at a time, you would then move on to the next phase, which is the area control and victory point phase. And in this instance, what you would do is you'd work out which areas are controlled by which side. For example, here we have a Spanish squadron in the Mirrors Abyssal. They, uh, let's just say, for example, they have a coaling order they control the Abyssal, they get one VP. Here, as the Americans are blockading, there are no other units around, they get one VP. Here, however, the squadron's transiting, they cannot control this area, so they do not get any VPs, even though they are the only ones there. If the units were like this, you would not have control so therefore you would not gain victory points as the Americans or as the Spanish either. Once you've worked out all the areas that are under the control of the different sides, you add the points to the track. Now at the beginning with the Americans, let's say the Americans have two victory points, they would move to this way, like so. Then you do the same for the areas with the Spanish moving back the other way. And if you go into a positive score for the Spanish, you flip over, and so on. Following that, you um, work out the combat losses uh, VPs. And so this is where the two different ships come into effect. So for example, you would look at the unit types, and each of those unit types has a value and then the total number you've destroyed in that round would either be added or deducted based on your losses in that game. Leaders take points based on their star rating, so if you kill this leader, that would be worth two. Following that, if you have managed to blockade or raid a port, um, you would then have three victory points for doing the disrupting of the port plus the defensive value. So in this circumstance, if you had managed to raid or blockade San Juan, you would take three plus two, which is five VPs. Um, the other possibility for VPs is to do with the orders. And this is where you have blockade with other orders of a certain type. The initiative player is blockading and the non-initiative player is calling or blockading or anchoring. You have what's called a VP event and you'd score two VPs, like so. Once the victory point phase has been determined, you then move to the repair phase. Each of the Ports, the friendly ports, has a repair value. If you are in a friendly port, you can repair up to the value shown on the port. So for example, San Juan can repair one damage, uh, Santiago there two, the Canaries one, Cadiz two, for example. You would need to be in the port um, and the port would not be disrupted when you, when you repair. When you have done the repair phase, you move to the next turn and any disrupted ports are flipped back to their regular side. If at the end of turn six, one side has at least six victory points, the game goes to the player with at least six victory points. If there is less than six victory points positive either side, the game is a draw. There are some optional rules depending on how 
you want to play the game, you can vary from that base setup. The most important one probably is that you can choose to have all your units face up rather than face down. Orders should still be hidden and until such time as they're revealed. However, you can play face up for the units. This is the Fog of War optional rule and it allows you to play the game solo or a more chess-like experience and less of a reliance on hidden movement. So the first optional rule is Fog of War. Another optional rule that's quite useful, particularly if you find the game a little bit of a struggle as playing as the Spanish, is you can have additional Spanish warships. There are other counters and when they are placed on the board, they would come on the board with a, a little asterisk just there where that white number is and they will indicate that they are the extra counters to play with for the extra warships optional rule. And um, uh, there are also a couple of extras for the Americans as well with that, that optional rule. You can also declare an automatic victory at a certain threshold. If you find you have one side reaching 29 or more points before the end of turn six, you can consider that an automatic victory. Other optional rules relate more to the realism with which the ships are um, damaged and how they break away from combat. Over a certain period of time with the maintenance rules, you can assign damage to the ships based on time in service, essentially. I won't go into the full details of that, but you can assign damage over a course of over a period of time through what's known as the maintenance special rule. And then there is a similar uh, repair rule alteration as well that allows you to um, repair only if units are in port for an entire turn. You can also, another optional rule is extend the overall game time to nine turns. And the only other optional rule I'll mention here is that you can have German warships starting in Caracas um, who are on the Spanish side and use Caracas there as their home base. And the repair value is applicable to those German ships. So there we have it, a whistle-stop tour through the main rules of Dawn of Empire. Quite a lot going on, but once you get the hang of what's, what's happening, you don't really get too stuck in the minutiae of the detail, as is often the case with, with war games. Um, crux of the game, really, if you're looking to understand one thing, is how the orders relate to other orders, and that is very important and the heart of the game. Um, I hope this has been helpful. I will do a follow-up video to show you the game in play, um, just to give you an idea of how the whole thing fits together rather than these more isolated rules segments. But for now, I hope you've enjoyed this video. hope it's been helpful. Please click that subscribe button if you're not already a subscriber, like and so on, and I will see you in the next video.